Hey seniors, I'm sporting my really cool Millen Trail hat here today and my really cool Millen Trail shirt, Hill Trail. Um, right now we're on hold with our cheerleaders there guys. Uh, they've postponed the cheer championships I heard, so that really stinks, but uh, hang in there. Hopefully they can get that in and you guys can go win the chip, bring back a championship to Millen Trail. So this is our lesson three notes for unit three. We've been talking about Congress. So I'll give you a second there. Go ahead and get out your notes. Remember, you must take good notes. Take good notes. Hmm. It's the key to civic success. Taking good notes in here. So you got your notes ready? All right, let's take a look. The last thing you should have in your notes is where we talked about party whips, political party whips, uh, party leaders in Congress. They usually do have seniority, and they go around and whip up or drum up support for bills and votes based on uh, party policies. We call them the influencers and enforcers. Now, I want you to activate your brain a little bit with this question. You know, we live in a world of superheroes and the Avengers were huge back when uh, Seth Ewing, when you and Aiden Lesher were little kids, the Avengers were huge. In fact, I remember Seth going, uh, Indy going with you and Cy, maybe a couple others, I can't remember, to go watch the Avengers Age of Ultron in the theaters together. Of course, with COVID, I think theaters are probably gone, but we can stream everything on net. And on Netflix, I, I've been, I got, uh, I haven't watched any of it yet, but I have uh, saved to my playlist to watch the Umbrella Academy, which is a little anti-hero type series on Netflix that some of you guys might have watched. So I haven't watched any of it yet, but it looks a little bit intriguing to me. The Umbrella Academy on Netflix. I'm going to watch that. But now think for a minute. Kobe Critchley, if you could have any superpower, what superpower would you choose and why? Hmm. This is where I wish we were in school because we could go around the room and talk about this for about five minutes. Be kind of fun, wouldn't it? I know that ever since I was a little kid, I really just thought that the superpower to fly would be like the ultimate. I don't know why. Just think it would be the coolest thing ever. I don't know. It'd be awesome. Some of you guys might think uh, it would be maybe Aaron Sizzler. Maybe you think Aaron Sizzler lifts weights. Maybe he thinks the, the superpower of uh, super strength Ugh, would be like the coolest superpower to have. Maybe that would be cool, wouldn't it, Sizzler? But uh, if you think about a superpower and what superpower you would like to have, see if yours is any on this, see, see if the one you chose is on this list. This is just a list of some classes from last year. Uh, somebody said they wanted the superpower of seduction, you know, to get people to do anything that they wanted, or mind readers, uh, teleporting, super strength, invisibility would be the ultimate superpower, I think, super stretch. These are all just some superpowers that some students from last year, you know, mentioned in some of the classes that we have. The ability to meet, read minds might not be, it might sound cool at first, but then maybe, maybe we don't want to read someone's mind. We don't know what they want to, we don't know what they, maybe we don't want to know what they think about us. Hmm. Oh, well. Now, the reason why I did that for you is so that you can connect it with something. We've been learning about Congress. Congress has superpowers. Congress has superpowers. So, you make sure that you pause this video so you can copy down our notes. Make sure you have some good notes. I've been thinking about maybe in this unit. Now, you think about this with me. I always give you a study guide to do. But maybe that's a little overkill right now. Maybe you, if you have all of the notes 
and you've done the assignments all the way up through that to the end of the unit, then maybe since we haven't been in school very much, you don't need the study guide. You can go on and take your test there online. If we ever get back to some type of normal schedule, I like doing the study guides in class where we can, you know, review and study them. But maybe on this unit, maybe we'll try it without it, but we'll see. I'll make my decision on that. But anyway, let's take a look at our first essential question in this section of notes. And it says, what are the areas where Congress, we know what le the legislative branch does. We know. Makes laws. The legislative branch makes laws. The executive branch enforces and carries out the laws. The judicial branch judges or interprets the laws. So Congress at the federal level is our legislative branch. So what are the areas where they have the power to make laws? That's EQ number five. So we're going to answer it with these things right here. And you can pause this and copy this down. But yes, these are the areas where Congress has the power to make laws. Anything to do with financing the government, they can make laws. Yes, guys, that's right. Taxes. Ugh. They can make laws about taxes. They can regulate American industries. They have the power to defend the country, to make uh, decisions to defend our the country, like declare war. They have the power to make, to enforce the laws and to, to make laws that provide for the enforcement of these laws. And they have the power to make laws in the areas of uh, growth and territories. Obviously, you know, our country isn't growing with territory much anymore, but we do have some territories and there is some, you know, a group of people out there who want to make Puerto Rico our 51st state. They are a U.S. territory at the present moment, but these are the areas where Congress has the power to make laws. Now, some of you guys thought that a superpower of super strength would be awesome. Some of you thought that superpower of teleportation would be awesome. Um, if you've watched, if you've watched uh, Lock and Key, series on Netflix, they have, they live, the whole premise of the story is these kids live in a house where there's magical keys, and the, the one of the coolest keys is the anywhere key, where you can unlock a door and go anywhere. Uh, you just step through the door and you're there. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? So that's kind of like teleportation, but we, we thought about your superpower that you would choose, but EQ number six says, list a special power that the House and the Senate have. You know that Congress is divided into two houses. You already know this. The Senate and the House of Representatives. The Senate, every state gets two senators. The House of Representatives, that's based on your state's population. West Virginia has three in the House. But anyway, this question says, okay, list a special power that the House and the Senate have. So, here we go. We are ready. The House... And I just listed a couple because there's no reason to get all in depth and name all of these things, but I listed two. Any bills on money always have to begin in the House. They can't start out in the Senate first. And I guess the purpose behind that is you're dealing with money. So, you know, the House has more representatives in it, so uh, maybe a greater representation of the population of the people. So maybe that's why that special power belongs to them. They also have a special power. And we learned this last year, last January, but uh, impeachment proceedings must begin in the House. The House is the one that has to bring up in, in, impeachment accusations against an elected government official like the president. And you can remember last uh, winter when the House brought up impeachment uh, proceedings against President Trump has to begin in the House. So these are two special superpowers that the House has. Now, what about the Senate? The Senate, I listed two of them here. These are maybe two of the most important ones, but for the Senate, they have a special superpower that all presidential appointees must be approved by the Senate. Have to be. Anybody the president appoints to a position on the executive uh, cabinet, any body that the president um, picks or appoints to the 15 executive departments must be approved by the Senate with a vote. So that is a special power the Senate has. 
For example, if you've been watching the news, Joe Biden is getting his cabinet ready. He is, uh, you know, selecting the people that's going to help him run the country. And once he takes office, all of these appointees that President Biden has appointed to their positions must be approved by the Senate. So that's a special superpower the Senate has. Another one, we know that the House has to start out impeachment proceedings, but impeachment, the impeachment trial is held in the Senate. They have that special superpower. They're the ones that hold the trial and will make the vote whether or not to remove the elected official from office or not. If you go back to last winter, the Senate voted not to, they voted not to remove President Trump from office. So those are some special powers that the House and the Senate have. Now, we talked about this briefly up there in, in EQ number five, but I put it in green here for us to remember again. There is a special superpower of Congress. Only Congress can declare war. The president can authorize military action, but if it goes over 60 days, it must be approved by Congress. Only Congress can declare war, not the president. And thankfully, not the states. If West Virginia could declare war, my gosh, it's hard to tell what these redneck West Virginians would do. Yeah. <laughs> We'd declare war on everybody, I think. But only Congress has the power to declare war. And, you know, in our checks and balances in our Constitution, it makes sense. Do you want the president, one man, to make that decision? Or would you rather have 535 people in Congress to make that decision? Now, you know, we haven't had an official declaration of war since World War II, really, but they do have that superpower. Now we get down to our six vocabulary words. And the very first one here is known as the elastic clause. And that's right, I put a picture over here of Santa Claus and his fat belly. And I put a picture of me trying to wear my stretchy pants and lose weight for Thanksgiving. You always, you, you never wear jeans to eat to Thanksgiving dinner. You have to wear stretchy pants so that it can stretch out there a little bit. Uh, that way you can eat more, I guess. But now let's go back and look at the elastic clause. The elastic clause in the Constitution. Now, this is scary, I guess, depending on how you want to look at it, but the elastic clause allows Congress the power to do what is necessary and proper to run the country. That's exactly a quote from the Constitution. No, seriously, in the Constitution it says Congress should have the power to, you know, regulate taxes. Congress should have the power to regulate industries and, and uh, the power to deal with growth and territories. And then, but then it also, you know, at the bottom, it also says that Congress shall have the power to do whatever is necessary and proper to run the country. It's called the Elastic Clause. And the reason why it's called the elastic clause, is because, just like it says right there, it stretches the power of Congress, like your stretchy pants. It stretches the power of Congress. Let's take a look. Oops, stretchy pants. Stretching out there. Because if you think about it, what's necessary and proper? Who decides that? What is necessary and proper? Congress decides. That pretty much stretches the power of Congress to include anything they feel like is necessary and proper to run our country. That's a pretty big, pretty big clause in the Constitution, and it's a pretty big burden for Congress to bear because they have that power listed to them in the Constitution by our founding fathers in case it was ever needed. You know, what is necessary? What is proper? Congress has the power to do that. It stretches their power to do whatever is necessary and proper. The elastic clause. Now, with that, tied to that, is this term here called the implied powers. 
implied powers. Now let's go back to English. If something is implied, that means that you kind of, it's not really written down, but you already know it, right? It's like, guys, you know, when your girlfriend says that they're going to go shopping this weekend, they're implying that you are going to go with them. <laughs> they don't really come right out and say it, but they're implying that you're going to go with them to help them shop. Oh, man. Anyway, if something is implied, it's not written down. It's not written in black or white ink. It's implied that you already know it. Like uh, an implied sentence in English is, close the door. Well, you is not written in that, right? But it's implied when they say close the door, it's implied that you are the one that's going to go close the door. You close the door. So the implied powers by, of Congress are the powers that are claimed by Congress under this elastic clause. Whenever, you know, it's not specifically written in the Constitution, but because they deem it necessary and proper, they can claim that power as an implied power under the elastic clause to do whatever is necessary and proper. All right, now there's a couple other terms that we've added in here. Um, treason. Any act against one's own country is an act of treason. Uh, most of you guys maybe have watched a movie on uh, Netflix, uh, Snowden, about Eric Snowden, who uh, basically was the whistleblower on the NSA, said the government's spying on all of us through our phones, um, which is, I mean, it's true, but it's almost like uh, George Orwell's book he wrote, 1984, and all the things he predicted, Big Brother is watching you. The government is watching you. They're watching all of us. Um, but anyway, Eric Snowden has been accused of treason because uh, it was considered an act against his country. I think right now he's uh, requesting asylum in Russia, and Russia isn't giving him up to, to us. Some of you may not think he's guilty of treason. Maybe some of you think he just spoke the truth and should not be tried with treason. But that's an argument for another time. But anyway, that's what the definition of treason is. Now, impeachment. We know that impeachment proceedings must begin in the House. We know that the impeachment trial is held in the Senate. Those are super special superpowers. But impeachment is the process of removing an elected official from office. We always get this a little confused. Impeachment doesn't mean that they've been removed from office. You know, uh, for example, you know, last year President Trump was impeached. That means he went through this process. The Senate found him not guilty and he was not removed from office, but he was impeached. Bill Clinton was impeached. But at the same time, Bill Clinton went through the process of impeachment. He was not removed from office because the Senate at the time when Bill Clinton was president voted not to remove him from office. Bill Clinton was a Democrat. Who do you think held the majority in the Senate when Bill Clinton was president? That's right, the Democrats. So they voted him, they, they voted not to remove him from office. So you can be impeached, but that doesn't mean you're going to be removed from office. Bill Clinton, President Trump, those are two great examples of that. Impeachment is just the process of going through that. That's what impeachment is. Now, we get to a term next called, it's one of my favorite terms, I love to say it. It's an ex post facto law. You can't be guilty after the fact. I like ex post facto law. You can say it with me. Ex post facto law. It's a cool word, and it? it's like saying onomatopoeia. That, that's a cool word. Ex post facto law. You're not guilty after the fact. Let's, uh, for example, ex post, and the reason why this is in here is ex post facto laws, they're not constitutional, and here's why. Let's just say that uh, Trump pushed through Congress a bill that uh, made it a law that in America, no one, no one can buy a foreign car. You have to buy an American-made car. And let's pretend the reason why Trump did that was to protect American businesses and American industries and help us out here in America. That's fine. Now let's, let's just pretend then that Alex Ellison 
before Christmas gets a brand new Toyota Celica. That sounds good, don't it, Alex? You ready to go drive that car? She's just so happy. She has this brand new Toyota Celica, and she's going cruising. She's going to, first place she's going is she's going to pick up Faith and Kobe Critchley, and they're going to hit sheets and hang out at sheets, because I guess that's what y'all teenagers do now. You're going to hang out at sheets. Okay. <laughs> Let's say that Trump's law takes place, takes effect January the 1st. So let's just say January the 2nd, Alex is cruising over to Sheets in her brand new Toyota and uh, the cops pull her over. And they pull her over and say, hey, uh, you know, by law, by the new law, you're not allowed to have any kind of car that's not American made and Toyotas are not American made. But see, Alex can say, well, I got this car before the law went into effect. You know, I got this car for Christmas. And therefore, she's not going to be held accountable for that. Because you can't be held accountable to something after the fact. If, if it wasn't against the law when you have it, then, it's, then you cannot be held, you're grandfathered in. It's, it's not going to be held against you. That's an ex post facto law. I hope I explained that good enough. Maybe I didn't. Alex, I don't think you're really getting a Toyota Celica for Christmas you're probably just gonna get a pair of socks. Sorry. <laughs> oh, man. Number 17 is a writ of habeas corpus. I always think of Gears of War and the corpser that you have to fight that big monster. Some of you guys out there are Gears of War video game fans. Habeas corpus, it's Latin. It means to have the body. A writ of habeas corpus um, if you are ever arrested and accused of a crime in West Virginia, you will know the reason why you're being held in jail. You can't just be put in jail for any reason. A writ of habeas corpus allows you, the accused person, to know why you're being held. Why do they have your body in jail? Why? You can't be put in jail for no reason. You might be innocent. You might be arrested for grand theft auto. You might be innocent of that, but you will know that that's why they have you in jail and that's why you were arrested, all because of a writ of habeas corpus. And the last word in this little section of notes is constituents. Constituents. Say that word with me. Constituents. It sounds like a bad word. It just don't sound like a very nice word. It's like, ooh, you little constituent. <laughs> but constituents, that's just me and you. You and me, people who are represented in government. I can explain a little further. You know, in West Virginia, we are here in West Virginia. We are constituents of Senator Manchin and Senator Capito. They represent us from here in West, by God, West Virginia. They represent us. We're their constituents. You see how that works? We are the people that, they, that we elected to represent us in Congress. We are their constituents. And that's all that word means. It's not really a bad word. But when you say, you constituent, you, well, you know, you are. You are a constituent. So am I. We all in West Virginia are because people represent us in government. We elected them to do that. Now, the thing is, they should listen to the voice of the people when it comes to voting on things and, and see what we want. A lot of times people we elect to Congress vote with their own agendas and their own ideas, and they forget about the people that they represent. They forget about their constituents. But that's when we as constituents should rise up and do what? Not revolt, or no, not riot. We should rise up and vote and vote for someone else who will listen to their constituents. That is the power we have as the people in America. America, as we like to say. Now, that's the end of this section of notes. So we covered some words like ex post facto law, writ of habeas corpus, constituents. You know what impeachment and treason mean. Hopefully you understand the elastic clause allows Congress to do whatever is necessary and proper. It stretches, ooh, stretches the power of Congress 
to do whatever is necessary. And we learned about some of the super special superpowers that the House and the Senate have. It may not be the superpowers that we would choose, but it's what they do have. We've learned those things. So I hope you've been taking good notes. What we're going to do, uh, there will be a couple of assignments in here to do um, in Lesson 4, or Lesson 3, rather. We're on Lesson 3. And uh, there will be an assignment to follow up on. So use your notes and answer that assignment and do the best you can. And hopefully all of you will be back in, soon, very, back in school very soon. As, as we work our way towards Christmas, Christmas break, and I feel really bad, Alex. I, I think, I hopefully, if maybe we should start a GoFundMe page so Alex can get a Toyota Celica for Christmas. Because I, I really think it, that she's going to be disappointed now. Oh, well. This is uh, Coach Eads. Until next time, over and out.